Uh, but in, in the context of this workshop, I'm first and foremost a rather ancient neurologist. I worked as a neurologist for a quarter of a century. And um, working in, in uh, clinics as a neurologist, you, you, of course, frequently, almost every day, run into the fact that uh, we understand the brain very little. The brain is basically the last frontier of human biology. And, and the complexity of the brain is at so many levels. Basically, the brain receives the sensory input, it analyzes it, puts together a view of the world. And, and one very important part of the, this view of the world is the separation of us and, and the outside. And, and um, I, one day, many, many years ago, I, when I came into the hospital where I worked, I was four bell paged to see the president of the hospital. Uh, Dr. Stephenson, Dr. Stephenson, Dr. Stephenson, please show up at the president's office. And somehow I had the feeling that a medical emergency would never happen in that office. So I walked re relatively slowly to the office. But when I came into, the, into his office, the first thing he did was that he jumped to his feet and said, one of your patients phoned me from the inpatient ward and said that you had put the left leg of another man into his bed. And when I started to smile, he looked at me and said, yeah, you know, you're not just a, a medical doctor, you're also a scientist. So the fact that I was a scientist made it more likely that I would put the left leg of another man into my patient's bed. And so I, so I just said to the president of the hospital, why don't we just go down to the hospital ward and take a look at this patient? And as we came into the patient's uh, room, he was trying to throw his left leg out of the bed. He had, a, an, he had an infarct, he had a stroke, and he had an infarct in the, post, at the, in the posterior parietal lobe at the junction between the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe, which is the part of the brain that, that takes care of the perception of self and others. And he had anosognosia, not recognizing his, his uh, left uh, hemiparesis. And he was convinced that this was, a, this was a foreign body in his bed. And uh, of course, we, we don't know any more today than we did at that time why this happened. We know an awful lot of bits and pieces about the way in which the brain works. We know a little bit about the way in which the cells are connected. But when it comes to understanding the brain as an organ of consciousness, we are basically in the starting position. And if you look at consciousness as having two major components, one of them is alertness that we lose and regain at least once a day. And people usually lose when I begin to lecture about <laughs> genetics. But and the other is the content of consciousness, our thoughts and emotions. And, and we haven't the faintest idea how the brain thinks. But one of, the, one of the things to begin to explore, at least at some superficial level, how the brain works and how diseases in the brain happen is to study human diversity. And basically, if you, if you study human, try to understand man by studying human diversity, you're diving into, into data of an experiment that has been going on for 200,000 years or since modern man arrived on the scene. And every generation, every individual of every generation has 75 new mutations that are not found in the parents. And so if you begin to multiply sort of the kind of diversity generated in this way, we have 8,000 generations and then we have 75 genera mutations times the population at every, each and every moment. So you have an enormously large experiment. It is sort of a Casper Cas9 experiment that has been going on for quite some time. So we begin our study of human diversity by studying the diversity in the sequences of, of DNA, the ACGs and Ts. But there is more to human diversity than that. The environment has enormous impact on it, first and foremost, 
through selection, and we have grown used to looking at evolution as happening through random chains and then selection of the environment uh, by the attribute uh, rooted in the, in the sequence that allows the individual who has the attribute to have more offspring than the one who doesn't. But the environment does much more than that. We are under the influence of the environment from the moment we are conceived until we die. And it's interesting because you, the older you grow, the more opportunity the environment has had to have an influence on you. You can basically look at time. You can look at age as a funnel that captures environmental influences. And it's interesting because most of the diseases that are, most of the big public health burdens in our society are diseases of, of a relatively old age, which has given the environment an opportunity to contribute to the pathogenesis. So basically, we have on one hand the diversity in the sequence and uh, the variants in the genome that contribute to the phenotypes, be the diseases or something else. And then we have this gap between the variants in the sequence and the phenotype. And the task at hand very often is to bridge this gap. And in this gap fits the environment. And the environment defined very broadly your education, your socioeconomic status, etc. And it is relatively, it is relatively easy to start to the, the genetic contribution to the phenotype. You just sequence the living daylight of a very large number of, of genomes, and you look for correlations. But it is more complicated when it comes to the environment. How are you gonna, how are you gonna put together a method that the, captures the diversity that we have in our environment? And that turns out to be very difficult. But we and others have started to pile on the top of the diversity in the sequence, diversity in level of RNA, diversity in the splice form, diversity in level of proteins in blood and isoforms of proteins, and then bring it all together eh, to look at the phenotype of interest. So what we are usually just doing is that we have a data set on diversity in phenotype, and we have a data set on diversity in the sequence, and then we look for non-chance association between the two. And, and here at ECOT, we have a very large data set to work with. I think we have substantially north of 200 petabytes of data that we are constantly using in the context of our study of human diversity. And actually, one place to begin with when you're trying to capture the environment is the proton. Uh, the, the proteins basically are the business molecules in our body. They make everything else. And it's interesting that uh, even, though we, we, you know, even though we can only pick up about 5,000 proteins in blood with the current technologies, these 5,000 proteins in blood are most of them in a dynamic equilibrium with the tissue where they do their work. So, so we can look at changes in correlation between levels of proteins and all kinds of, of phenotypes. And, and it's interesting that basically all proteins in our body will end up in blood in one point in time or another because they use the blood to get to the liver where they are metabolized or to the kidney where, where they are excreted. And I told you before that you could basically look at, look at the age as a funnel that captures environmental influences. And I told you that you can use the proteins to capture some of the environmental effects. So if both of these state statements are true, you would expect that there is a correlation between level of proteins in blood and age. And, and actually, yeah, actually, most of the proteins in blood correlate with AIDS. And actually, if you take a large number of proteins, in this case, I think we took about 1,900 proteins, and used a relatively simple machine learning algorithm, we, we managed and we plotted basically to select the proteins and we plotted the level of proteins uh, against AIDS, the, the, the chronological aid. The correlation is very good. The R squared is about 0.96. So, so uh, so, and, and if we then take that and we begin to ask the question, how can we, how can we use proteins, not just individual proteins, but a collection of proteins to give us predictions about biological processes? One of the, one of the things we did is that we took a fairly large number of proteins, 
and 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 we have, we had the protein from people who had were recruited about 13 to 15 years ago, a, a, a fairly large number of individuals and and 23,000 individuals, and in that group, there were, when we started to look at the protein, we had about 7,000 deaths, and basically by collecting. Uh, by putting together this relatively simple model, we could find 5% of people between the ages of 60 and 80 who had about 88% probability of dying within the next five years, and uh, another 5% who had virtually no probability of dying within the next five years. So this is a bit of an Orwellian you know, instrument to be able to find the people who are at high probability of dying. And, and the question comes up, what do you want to use that for? And basically, we have shown that even though this is probably a, 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 a method to, to measure fairly broad uh, human frailty, you can reverse that with relatively simple methods. For example, by, by, by forcefully treating blood lipids, you can reverse this substantially. But what's interesting about this is that we have a data collection of about 18, 19,000 people who have been phenotyped exquisitely uh, for all organ systems. And we could show that, that the, the, the uh, amount of life you're predicted to have left is inversely correlated with hand strength, inversely correlated with performance in exercise tolerance tests, and inversely correlated with the with, with test of cognitive function. And it's interesting because if you think about cognitive function and, and our tendency to look at that as something separate and apart from physical health, that there is a very, very good correlation between the performance of your brain, the clarity of your thought, your performance on test of cognitive function, and general physical health. We just have to accept that the brain is simply an organ put together from the same kind of information as the rest of the body and, and abides by, by most of the biological principles that other organ systems do. So one of them, and, and this is important when we are talking about on one hand physiological function and the other hand diseases, because if you, if you, if you skip basically, if you take cancer out of the, out of the picture, because cancer is basically a mutational disease, and, and therefore very much a disease of chance, that almost all diseases of man are, cons is, are consequences of, of perturbed physiological function. So the task at hand for those of us who are trying to figure out diseases is to try to figure out what biochemical pathway is perturbed that leads to a disease, what biochemical pathway is upregulated or downregulated and, and in that way lead to a disease. And let's take an ever so brief look at Alzheimer's disease. All right, we have made a few discoveries of variants in the genome that affect the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And the first one we found was a, a mutation in the APP gene that confers a substantial protection against Alzheimer's disease. And what is interesting, if you look at the lower graph there, is that a variant in a genome that confers a very, very strong protection against Alzheimer's disease. This is the biggest protection that any sequence variant in the genome has been shown to confer. That this variant also slows down the normal cognitive decline of the elderly. So, so a variant that uh, protects against Alzheimer's disease slows down the normal cognitive decline of the elderly. The other paper that I showed you up there is one on, on the TREM2 protein. We found a, a one point allele of 1.2% that confers substantial risk of, of Alzheimer's disease. And, and that one accelerates the normal cognitive decline of the elderly. So we have a HER2 sequence variant, one that protects against Alzheimer's disease, another that predisposes to Alzheimer's disease. And both of them affect the rate of the cognitive decline of the elderly. And this is interesting because if you look at the histologic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, they are the amyloid plot and the neurofibrillary tangle. And when you look at brains from normal elderly people or elderly people with no history of Alzheimer's disease, no history of 
of, of advanced uh, cognitive decline, you will find amyloid plaques, you will find neurofibrillary tangles, although you don't find them in the same density as in Alzheimer's disease. So the histologic criteria for Alzheimer's disease are quantitative. And, and the reason I'm emphasizing this is that it, this indicates to me that Alzheimer's disease is probably an accelerated form of normal aging of the brain. They are the people at the tail of the distribution who end up having this diagnosis. And it's interesting because we have at a relatively high frequency, for example, the APOE4 allele in Iceland has the allelic frequency of, of about 18%. So it is, it is not an uncommon variant. And so if you look at the way in which APOE4 affects risk of Alzheimer's disease, you see that the non carriers of APOE4 have a mean age of one set of 75. Yeah, there. Then you have the heterozygous who have a median of 72 and the, the homozygous median age of one set of 68. But when you take, however, a APOE4, people with a, who are, are carriers of APOE4, and you ask the question, what impact does APOE4 have on cognitive function of younger people? What impact does, does APOE4 have on your fate in life? And basically, people with, who are uh, carriers of APOE4, doesn't matter whether they are heterocyclers or homocyclers, they have the same educational attainment as people in society in, in general. But when you begin to cognitively, cognitively phenotype them, it's interesting that the homocyclers have a, a very, very sharp decline in cognitive function after 55 years of age, even though the median age at the, at the time of diagnosis is only is 68 years. So basically for 13 additional years, this individual has been suffering a little bit of a cognitive decline. One of the, one of the things that we have been doing at ECOT is to use uh, all kinds of stuff. Magnus Ulvarsson, who will be giving you a talk later on, has been using MRI images to um, evaluate brain age and look at the difference between chronological age and brain age. So if your brain age, as assessed with the MRI scan, it exceeds your chronological age, it indicates that something wrong is happening in your brain. But we have also been using the proteome to assess age first and foremost assessing the age of the individual. Take a large number of proteins, you, you, know, you, can, you can determine the age of an individual very accurately with about 1,900 proteins. And then the question is, you know, what is happening if your predicted age using the proteome exceeds your chronological age? It indicates that something wrong is happening in your body. But you can make it even more specific than that you can take proteins that are just expressed in single organ, and you can use those to, to predict AIDS. And in that way, you're basically, you're predicting the organ age. And then you can use the protein, you know, the totality of the proteome to assess the age of the individual, and then you can begin to explore where the, where the problem may be by then looking at the age of individual organs. And this is just, you know, listing the, the sort of the number of proteins that are used to, to, uh, to assess the age of individual organs. And it isn't a surprise that um, the largest number of proteins are used to assess brain age, because only about half of the genome is only expressed in the brain. And, and, uh, and basically, when you use the proteins from the brain, you can determine the age of the individual more accurately than, than any other organ, simply because you have more proteins to work with. And, and this is just an example. If you then go and you look at people with, with, uh, with various diseases, in this case, this is just Alzheimer's disease, you know, which one of the organs of the body are predicted to have AIDS more by having Alzheimer's disease than others? And, and of course, the brain is at the top of that list. But uh, let's then take a, a look a little bit at the, the disease that I look at as the, as the most human of all diseases. 
It's a disease of thoughts and emotions. And keep in mind, thoughts and emotions are the phenomena that define us as a species and define us as individuals of the species. And basically, in 2018, there were about you know, 145 variants in the genome that have been correlated with risk of, of schizophrenia. And actually, the number has grown substantially since then. But, but the problem is that in spite of all of these variants in the genome that have been discovered, even though they are, some of them are coding sequence variants in genes, some of them are definitely with loss of function, some with, with gain of function, these discoveries have told us very little about schizophrenia. I mean, we know it is a disease of thought and emotions, but basically, how does it come about? It's not, it is, we are no closer to it now than we used to be. And, and one, of the, one of the problems with, with a disease of thought and emotions is that since we don't know how the brain thinks, how are we going to go about studying the things that affect cognition, affect thought? We don't know how the brain thinks, and actually we don't even have a definition of a thought. How are you going to study the things that affect something that you cannot even define? It becomes really difficult. So, but one of the things that we did is that we took a bunch of variants in the genome that affect the risk of, of schizophrenia, fairly highly penetrant, but not fully penetrant. So let's say that the penetrance is about 10%, or let's say about 10% of those who have these variants develop schizophrenia, but 90% of them don't. And we know that there are very well-defined cognitive abnormalities in schizophrenia, so what we decided to do is to ask the question, what impact do these variants have on cognition of those who carry them and do not develop schizophrenia? And, and actually, indeed, what we did is that we found out that the, 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 the departure from the normative norm in the carriers of these variants is in exactly the same categories as in the patients. They are not quite as severe, but they are very significant. So if you, if you carry these variants and you don't develop schizophrenia, eh, you have cognitive abnormalities or, co or departures in cognition from the normative norm that are of the same sort as schizophrenics. And what does that mean? It means that it isn't that you develop schizophrenia and therefore you think differently. It is much more likely to be that because you think differently, you're at risk of schizophrenia basically emphasizing that your cognition may not be inconsequential, uh, which should not come as a surprise because the function of most of your organs are, or it's very rare that the function of your organ is, uh, is inconsequential. So at the time that we published it, we published this in Nature many, a few, seven, eight years ago, and at that time it was very well documented that in families of schizophrenics, you're more likely to have creative individuals than in the population in general. There was a very large study done in Sweden eh, documenting this. And that shouldn't come as a surprise, because you're more likely, if you're in family of schizophrenics, to have variants in the genome that affect the way in which you think, make you think differently. And to be able to be creative, you have to think differently from others. You cannot think like everyone else, and, and in that become creative. So what we did is that we took a, took a polygenic score for, for schizophrenia, and we look at members, members of, of the associations of, of, the, of the creative profession, the Association of Icelandic Writers and Painters and Composers, etc. And indeed, we showed that they have substantially greater polygenic risk score for schizophrenia than the population in general, which means that schizophrenia and creativity share biology, which is terribly interesting. Basically, it indicates that the attributes that gave us things like the music of Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven is an attribute that about 1% of the population pays a very heavy price for because the population prevalence of schizophrenia is about 1%. Uh, but then, what is creativity? And, and this aspect of the story is, 
is the one that my late mother would not have liked particularly, because the higher your polygenic score for schizophrenia, the more likely it is that you belong to the creative profession, but also the higher your polygenic score for schizophrenia, the more likely you are to have offspring children with more than one partner. So novelty seeking clearly is one of the, one of the components of the creativity that we have been documenting. It's interesting because, uh, because uh, what we consider to be abnormal, what we consider to be a sign or a symptom of, of, um, of a psychiatric disease uh, tends to change. Our views of, of the norm is constantly changing. And one of the things that is interesting is that if you take, if you, if you take uh, you know, polygenic risk for schizophrenia, it correlates with addiction, all kinds of addiction. Uh, and, and actually, if you, if you take the polygenic score for most of the psychiatric diseases, they have a tighter correlation with, with uh, addiction than the disease that they are developed for in many instances. But what is interesting is that the polygen score for schizophrenia correlates very well with smoking, and actually about 95% of schizophrenic smoke. And actually when we looked at this in the Icelandic population, in about 1910 to 1920, the polygen score for schizophrenia of smokers and non-smokers was pretty much the same. And now the prevalence of smoking has gone down in Iceland very dramatically. So around 1990, the polygenic score for schizophrenia of those who smoke is very substantially greater than of those who do not smoke. So gradually smoking has become one of the signs of a disturbed brain, has become a sign of, or in this case, could be looked upon as one of the signs of schizophrenia. And, and this is an interesting you know, aspect of, uh, of the problem of those who work on diseases that are, uh, that are defined in a, in a behavioral manner. But, but the next little story I want to tell you emphasizes how, how important it is for the understanding of diseases and organs outside of the brain, how important it is to understand the way in which the brain works. And, and um, the, the problem I want to point you to is the problem of obesity. If you take obesity and you ask the question, what are the diseases that come with obesity? Obesity is one of the, well, one of the strongest predisposers to heart failure, to non-alcoholic liver disease, to type 2 diabetes, to osteoarthritis, to all kinds of cancers. And, and one of the ways in which we measure obesity is to measure body mass index. Body mass index is just this ratio of height and, and weight. And it's not perfect, but it is widely used. And, and it, it, is, it is the one where we have the biggest amount of data. So if you take a polygenic score for BMI, and then and then it correlates very well with the diseases that I mentioned before. It correlates very well with heart failure, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, type 2 diabetes, etc. But if you correct for BMI, these, this polygenic score has really no impact on these diseases. So the effect of these, these variants in the genome that lead to high BMI on the risk of this disease is all mediated through the BMI. Almost all mediated through the BMI. Then the big question comes, what is the physiological function that the sequence variants affect? How do these variants in the genome affect the BMI? And it's interesting if we begin to look at physiological functions, that basically, this, what you're looking at here is the effect of, of one standard deviation of the polygenic score for BMI. And what the first and foremost effect is cognitive function. The higher your polygenic score for BMI, the worse is your performance in total, you know, on trail-making tests for 
performers I to verbalize you the lessons your educational attainment. So basically, the polygenic score of, of, of BMI, the genetic propensity to, uh, to uh, become obese, what it affects is the function of your brain and, and function of the, of, the, of the cerebral cortex. And that should not come as a surprise because eating behavior is the most important, almost the singular thing that affects your probability of, of becoming obese. And whatever takes away from you the control of your eating behavior seems to take away from you control of, of many other of the cortical functions. When you, when you look at, when you look at, at sort of uh, health-related phenotypes, one of the things that uh, the, BM, the polygenic score for BMI affects is the time when you have your first child. The higher your polygenic score for BMI, the earlier you have your first child, and the more children you have altogether. What does that mean? It means that there's a positive selection for high polygenic score for BMI, which is a, which is a bit scary. So it's not, just, it's not just easy access to food, who is making us fatter by the generation, there's also a positive selection for the genetic propensity to become obese. But we'll come back, and come back to that in a minute because I also told you that there is an inverse correlation between a polygenic score for BMI and educational attainment. But, but if, you, if you go the other way, here we were going from a genetic uh, sequence variants that affect your BMI to cognitive function, but we can go the other way around as well. We can begin with the cognitive function. So if, if you remember that we can sort of divide the um, measure of cognitive function into two major components, the G factor that exists because basically all of the measures of cognitive function are positively correlated. You score high in one, you score high in another. But if you take away the, the G factor, you're left with polar opposites, the visuospatial ability on one hand and the verbal ability on the other. So we developed a polygenic score for verbal ability and polygenic score for visuospatial ability. And the higher your polygenic score for visuospatial ability, the greater your BMI, the lower your score on the personality trait called openness that correlates with curiosity and creativity and the less is your risk of schizophrenia. The higher your polygenic score for verbal ability, the less is your BMI. The higher your score on, on uh, openness that correlates with creativity and, and um, uh, curiosity and creativity, and the greater is your risk of schizophrenia. So your cognitive style has an impact on your body composition which I think is, is, is absolutely fascinating. But, but uh, I also showed you there before that the higher your polyclinic score for, uh, for uh, BMI, the, the less is your educational attainment. And then I told you that there was a positive selection for uh, polyclinic score for BMI, which means basically when you add this together that there is a negative selection against educational attainment. But we did a direct study of this, all right? And remember, we and others have, have discovered a very large number of variants in the genome that affect your educational attainment. There's actually a fairly strong component behind it. But we did a direct study of this. And, and actually, it's been known for a long time that the uh, people who have a lot of education have fewer children than people who have little education. And we have been explaining this away with all kinds of funny things like people who are acquiring education don't have time to, to uh, have children and, and stuff like that, which is utterly, thoroughly ridiculous, like, like um, you know, being engaged in a very boring study in, at the university diminishes your sex drive and stuff like that. It, it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, at all. But what we did is that we took the polygenic score for educational attainment. We took generate the polygenic score out of all of these variants, 
and we looked at how that had changed in Iceland over 75 years. And basically, there has been a negative selection of the genetic propensity to acquire education. And this effect is not small. This is about a 0.6 standard deviation a century, which is a very large effect on, on an evolutionary scale. And it's interesting because the Polygenic School for Educational Attainment influences all kinds of parameters of health. So basically, basically uh, at this point, when we, when we uh, published this paper, we, our interpretation was that uh, we were getting dumber by the generation. And for those of us who are, you know, already senior citizens made us feel fairly good, you know. <laughs> you dumb idiot may look better than me, but my God, you're more stupid. But, but, but actually, it isn't that way. It is really, really interesting. It is really interesting. There is no negative selection, as you can see, there is no negative selection uh, on, on polygenic score for IQ. There's a negative selection for educational attainment. So the negative selection for educational attainment is a negative selection on, of a non-IQ attribute that allows you to acquire education. And actually, it is, it is clearly an attribute that is fairly obvious, although we don't see it. And why do I say it is obvious? Because when you look at a sort of mating, there is a sort of mating on the basis of educational attainment. People with similar education, they tend to mate. But there is no sort of mating on the basis of IQ. So whatever this non-IQ component or attribute that allows you to acquire education is sufficiently obvious that people mate on the basis of it. But we, the fucking idiots trying to figure this out, we cannot see it. It's, a, it's an interesting because when, when, we are, <coughs> when we are thinking about when we are thinking about the effect of environment on our phenotype, particularly on diseases, eh, we are, and, and our tendency to try to divide this into one hand genetic component, the other hand the environmental component, we often end in a relatively difficult position. Because, you know, the only environment that matters is in here, all right? That's where our world is. It's not out there. And, and, and it's interesting when you, when you take, when you take, you know, when you look at the really elementary genetics, the way in which all of us were put together is that there was a random selection of chromosomes from uh, our grandparents into germ cells of our parents that then were, went into a fertilized egg containing a complement from the father and a complement from the mother. We, all of us, have half of the genome of our mothers and half of the genome of our fathers. So what happens to the other half, the half of the genome of our parents that were not passed on to us? We, because we can face the genomes of everyone in Iceland, we could ask the question, does do sequence variants in the non-transmitted part of the genome of our parents, do they have any impact on who we are? Do they have any impact on our fate? And indeed, there are variants in the genome of our parents, and particularly our mothers, but also our fathers, have enormous impact on our fate in life. They have an impact on the education. They have impact on our risk of addictive disorder, cardiovascular disease, and you name it. And then what, what are these variants? What, what is this half of the genome of our parents? What does it do? It is half of what makes our parents. So basically, it is what we have done is to go extraordinarily expensive and, and um, long route to uh, be labeled obvious. Our parents matter. 
the way in which they treat us. The mother particularly, but her parents are an extraordinarily important part of our, our environment when we are early on growing up. And actually, you can we have taken it beyond that. The non-shared component of the genome of our siblings has an impact on and we go, can go to more distantly related uh, relatives. So basically, there's this genetic environment or genetic nurture is of extraordinary importance on making it. So it basically tells us we are many ways like an ants in an anthill. We are, we are, yes, we are ants, but we are also a component of, of the structure that we, we call the anthill. And, and, and to make it even, to rub it in even more, when it comes to the inability to separate genetics and, and environment, you know, I, I love this example of, of lung cancer. In Iceland, 97.5% of those who develop lung cancer have smoked for decades. So it is a pure environmental disease. Without this environment that we call tobacco smoke, lung cancer doesn't exist. But we and others have, have discovered a very, very large number of variants in the genome that are such that if you have them, and you, you're more likely to smoke than if you don't have them. And if you smoke and you have them, you smoke more. And you smoke and you have them, it's more difficult for you to quit smoking. So basically, you inherit the compulsion to seek the environment that causes the disease. Yeah. So where is the line of distinction between nature and nurture? It basically doesn't exist. So in the end, I want to do emphasize that it is the function of the brain, or a dysfunction of the brain, that is responsible for a very, very large percentage of the common diseases of man in organs outside of the brain. Because the organ, as a controller of our behavior, is what predisposes us to all kinds of diseases. And what is more, the way in which you think, the way in which you utilize your brain, has an impact on the composition of the rest of the body. So that's all I wanted to say today, and thank you for your attention. We have time for a couple of questions. Anyone from the audience? I want to emphasize to the audience that the one who asked the question is in large way responsible for the answer, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. I would start with one, if I may. So you have mentioned the, the line of your parents and the mother that is basically influencing also you, yourself. But we see also um, that there are many programs to help people getting away from addiction, so counterfeit the genetic traits you basically inherited. How do you think is that effective? How you can think about ways making it better um, with people, you know, have suffering from diseases or, uh, you know, having alcoholic disorders and, and so on? It is up. Addiction is a very, very difficult condition. And um, we as a society are struggling with it. If you take Iceland, for example, the Icelandic healthcare system, the official Icelandic healthcare system has, has uh, pays very little attention to addiction. We have a tendency to look at it as a bad behavior. And uh, I mean, people have, listen to me, people are constantly coming up with new ways to treat addiction. The most popular one today is to use um, psychedelics, all right? They are supposed to um, give you a break from difficult priors, all right? Yeah. Yeah, half a century ago when I was taking LSD, no one told me it would give me a break from anything. <laughs> so, so, but now, now it is supposed to be a way to do it. I think, 
I mean, there is a price to be paid for uh, the affluence of our societies. There is always going to be a certain percentage of the population that abuses it or ends up in abuse because of it. And I don't think that we will have any. I'm very pessimistic on the possibility of getting rid of addiction. And I think even a society where there is no danger of addiction, it may be a very boring society. This was not very optimistic, I admit to that. There's someone up there. Hey, um, really thought-provoking talk. So I have a couple of questions that m may need an opinion. Um, so first of all, looking at the, the schizophrenia bipolar data and the correlation with addiction, do you have ways to be able to separate out the individuals who were labeled as addicted because they were self-medicating for an extended period of time? because they were smart enough to recognize they might have schizophrenia or bipolar tendencies. So that's question number one. Question number two, I'm really curious about the education. Yeah, I, I, I okay, go on. Don't, don't uh, test my memory for all <laughs> questions. I, I, I don't think that this idea of cell medication is particularly relevant when it comes to schizophrenics, all right? because currently we have no drugs really that effectively influence the clinical course of schizophrenia. The only drugs we have today are, are very unspecific drugs that basically are like putting a blanket on the brain and they, are, they have no addictive potential. It is just this loss of control that, uh, that constitutes schizophrenia. Uh, loses the individual control over so many things. So there is a very, very close correlation between schizophrenia and, and uh, addiction. And besides that, I don't think that schizophrenia is a dichotomous trait. We, we, we deal with it as a dichotomous trait. But um, if, you, if you look at the first degree relatives of patients with schizophrenia, they are fairly, they, 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 most of them are, are somewhat unusual. So basically, I, I think that we have people in this audience here who fall on the spectrum mm -hmm. uh, in the center where you have schizophrenia. So the second piece is all about the links with the uh, parental, the genetic nurturing and the educational attainment piece. Because we live in a society, and yet where, where we, we have measures of educational attainment, right, that might not necessarily correlate with the creativity that you're talking about and the IQ that you're talking about. And I'm wondering if you have a means to be able to separate those out, too, within the populations that you work with here. Will you, will you be more specific in this question? Are you asking me? whether we have tried to separate what? Um, so the measures of attainment with respect to creativity and the ability to, to go into more creative or achieve in more creative lines as opposed to math scores, English scores, history scores, science scores, which is how we tend to judge you know, I, educational I, I, attainment. You see, I... I didn't mention when I was talking about the correlation between schizophrenia and creativity that the membership in the associations that I was talking about mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're creative. It means that you have an aspiration to be creative ah. or someone has fooled you and told you you were creative. So, so that is a weakness in that study. Uh, and, and it is probably very difficult to develop some sort of a... a tangible scale, you develop a tangible scale on which you me measure creativity, it's, it's difficult. But, but the, the old stories about the crazy genius, I think are true. I know a lot of uh, 
of rather difficult individuals who are very creative. Thank you for your beautiful lecture. Victor Yersa from Marseille. Um, you started off by reminding us how difficult it is to define thought. Yeah. Uh, this is undoubted. Uh, one difficulty thereof in particular is uh, the temporal component of thought. Um, what component of thought? Temporal yes, component, yes, yes. Yeah? the time evolving yes. nature of thought. And very often what we do when we deal with thought and cognitive cognition, we collapse it into words that give up this uh, temporal component and then we uh, talk about intelligence, cognitive capacity, etc. Um, in your lecture then you evolved uh, and you made correlations, mostly statistical analysis uh, to microscopic descriptors, genetic, proteomic, etc. Is there a way in between? I'm thinking in particular of brain activity. Uh, Neuroelectric brain activity, it also has the time evolving component. Yeah? And the link between thought and brain activity is evolving over time is also a difficult one. But brain activity, we can measure, we can quantify it, we have access to it, at least uh, partially and probably better than to thought. When thinking of schizophrenics, and this is my question, when thinking of schizophrenics, are there entry points measuring brain activity and linking it to some of the underlying quantifiers that you demonstrated that uh, provide us a better understanding of the origins of schizophrenia and uh, leading to a better treatment of schizophrenia. What is the current status of brain activity description in this context? Is it helpful? I, I, um, I am actually impressed with the way in which you could talk in a very intelligent way about thought without really ever talking about thought. Because you have to, before we begin to develop correlations between electrical activity in the brain or any other activity and, and how it affects thought, we have to define thought, all right? And it doesn't give you a way out to say that thought has a temporal component. Of course it has a temporal component. Everything, this bloody motherfucking time is everywhere, all right? It's a part of everything we do and we don't. So unless we find a way to define thought, we are going to have enormous difficulties with, with uh, figuring out how to study it. And, and we are not going to make much progress in figuring out what causes schizophrenia before we have figured out a way of studying the physiological functions that are perturbed by the disease. We are, you know, you, you call this a big brain. I don't know, you know, I don't know what makes you guys call this a big brain, but I can tell you when it comes to understanding of the brain, we are at an extraordinarily primitive state. Thank God, because we have so much left to do. I'm, for young people like me, it's very important to have something to do. Thank you. Uh, fascinating, Gary. Um, I was struck by the, your distinction between IQ and educational attain attainment. And you draw, in that distinction, I guess there are, there are intrinsic properties like self-determination, self self-reliance, focus, and all those things. Mm -hmm. And there's also family, mm -hmm. the environment, the SES, the, the ability of your parents to afford to put you through school. So which, which of those two do you think is, was more uh, PRS-related that gave you the, res the distinction that you showed? I, I, I have to admit that when it comes to try to understand what it is that uh, the next selection is, is focusing on, I think this, this idea of the 
assorted to mating is a particularly interesting. Something that we see in each other <laughs> and, and we don't see <laughs> and, and we mate on the basis of it. I think it's, it's fascinating. If, I mean, this is a complicated system, and I was trying with the story of the non-transmitted part of the genome to point out that genetics not only affect your parents, always affect you. And you're absolutely correct, the family environment, all of that, that has an impact on it. But it is, it is as I said before, it's perhaps a very expensive way that we used to be labeled obvious which is that there is more to education than just intellect. And, and it's interesting that the intellect is not done to negative selection. Again, I thank you for a very excellent uh, lecture, if I may. Uh, you had said early on of correlation of hand strength and risk for uh, mortality. And you are making me think, is, is the correlation really uh, what happens, let me rephrase, what happens in the case of hand agility? Is there also a correlation? Hand what? Agility. Agility. So instead of strength, uh, if you were to assess uh, agility. To agility is not the quality of the hand. <laughs> All right. Agility is the quality of the entire individual. Uh, I think, I think... You could assess... Uh, let me finish my answer. You can yes, yes. correct me when I'm done. Uh, the, the performance on the exercise tolerance test is probably a better measure of the agility. The performance on the test of cognitive function is probably a better measure of agility. The interesting thing about this is that we, we use this bunch of proteins, there are about 120 proteins in a in not too complicated or an algorithm to, to assess what is left, left alive. And what is interesting is that this test gives you a biomarker of the fatality. You can reverse it. We have applied this to a material coming out of a clinical trial, and we just show that even though you have this broad measure of frailty we can reverse it with a specific focused intervention. So this is not just an Orwellian method to, that brings you sort of a doom and gloom, it's a biomarker. It can be useful in, in assessing your way of impact to your own health or the health of others. Now you have an opportunity to correct me. I will venture just a little bit further. Uh, my understanding is that the great apes, the chimpanzee and uh, chimpanzee and uh, gorillas, have very strong hands. So I know I'm 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 going aside, but you make me wonder if one could uh, assess uh, age and mortality with a very simple thing like hand strength and maybe agility. You see, the, this test that we developed of this assessment of what is left alive, we applied to a very large number of people in whom we had phenotyped all organ systems, every single organ system, people who came in for about four and a half hour assessment. And, and what I told you, which is the test of cognitive function, the hand strength and the performance on, on exercise tolerance test were the only ones that were significantly affected. So another question here. Um, hi. Um, how do you envision the future of genetic modification of the gut uh, microbiome? And what potential benefits uh, and applications could it offer in terms of human health and uh, disease prevention? You see, you, you, you basically, you were very unlucky to ask me a question about the gut microbiome, because I'm not entirely sure that it exists. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. It, it, the, the idea that the gut microbiome influences all of who you are 
influences risk of autism and schizophrenia and things like that. I think that is bullshit. I think that the gut microbiome has significant impact on all kinds of inflammatory diseases, particularly inflammatory diseases of the gut, but also some, some inflammatory diseases of, of joints. But I, I think, you know, the study of the gut microbiome is about started significantly, let's say about 15, 20 years ago, it became very fashionable and I think that people have been embellishing a little bit the impact of the gut microbiome. That's all I'm willing to say. We, have, we, we haven't done a lot of studies of the microbiome, but we have been studying all of the diseases that the gut microbiome is set to influence. Okay, we have time for one more, but then we have to call it a day. Behind me, oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi. So you talked about um, aging as sort of a linear accumulation of environmental factors over time. Uh, and then you talked about the... No, 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 no. I did not talk about the aging as a linear anything with time. Okay. I said the influence of the time it, it accumulates okay. probably in some in somewhat linear fashion, but also non-linear. No question about it. Okay. So my question is um, when you talk about the genetic nurture component. Um, do you think that, that the majority of that effects of the genetic nurture happen at a very young age? Or is it sort of a, is there some function by which you can map how much that matters over time? I, I, I'm thinking about it in the context of like diseases that evolve really early on uh, in the lifespan versus later on in the lifespan and how much genetic nurture might, be, might affect an early disease versus a the, the, the genetic nurture is a fancy name for a re relatively simple thing. It's basically that as a, as a young child, at least, you're under substantial influence of your closest family. That's all. And there's a lot of studies that have been done on the impact of, of your early childhood, on your fate in life. And, and uh, nothing of what we have done adds to that, nor does it detract from it at all. Uh, 